The city of Albany is the capital of New York State. These days, Albany is a bustling seat of government, but a lot has changed around here in the past four centuries. The ground I'm standing on right now was once the manor of Resenyeswick. In the early 17th century, when New York was still New Netherland, the Dutch West India Company realized that the fur trade here was thriving, but they couldn't be bothered to maintain it. They were off establishing global trade routes. They needed a way to quickly populate the area with colonists. So they negotiated with Native Americans for land that went to investors or patroons on which less wealthy colonists could live. Most Dutch patroonships didn't make it far off the ground, but Killian van Resslinger was different. He wanted to create something that would last, something that would prosper in areas of life well beyond the fur trade. And he did. His manor was so successful, it set up a sort of feudal system that defined the region's social order for over 200 years. It lasted so long, it had to die out, literally. Stephen van Resslinger III, the eighth patroon of Resslinger was the good patroon. He expected tenants to pay rent for living on his land, as in any manor system. But if tenants fell on hard times, as tenants do, he'd grant them exemptions from paying full rent. And people liked that. It felt fair. As far as wealthy colonial estate owners go, he was a pretty nice guy, but his leniency had a limit. In 1839, Wrestlinger III died, and his will instructed his heirs to collect all outstanding debts immediately. As expected, tenants simply couldn't pay, and when the new landowners outright refused to negotiate, it felt like an injustice. Tenants' lives were so disrupted, they revolted, not just against rent collectors, but against the entire manor system itself. The anti-renters, as they called themselves, issued a declaration of independence and the six-year anti-rent war began. Spoiler alert, the anti-renters won. They convinced delegates from across the state to pass the New York State Constitution of 1846. It ended feudal tenures, placed limits on land leases, and added provisions for tenants' rights, which all sounds great, right? Well, not exactly. There were other major legislative outcomes of the anti-rent war. One was New York Penal Law 240-35, Subdivision 4, and its history is problematic. It came as a bold move by then Governor Silas Wright to stamp out the Calico Indians, a menacing military threat of over 10,000 strong at their peak, who would appear in full ceremonial dress to ambush rent collectors and law enforcements, sometimes tarring and feathering their enemies and sometimes using advanced military techniques. And if that sounds like a contradiction, it's because it is. The Calico Indians weren't a wartime ally to the anti-renters because the Calico Indians never existed. They were the anti-renters. As the men went out and fought, they enlisted their wives and children to build them bright, distracting costumes that transformed them into the caricature of an Indian. The last thing these former feudal tenants wanted was to be recognized in battle. They were in debt. They had a lot to lose, but they went further than to disguise themselves for protection. They knew, fully costumed in the eyes of their opponents, they were savages, unbound by social constraints. They chose to deliberately fight as people who would be perceived as less than law-abiding citizens, so they could commit acts no law-abiding citizen would dare commit. So yeah, they overthrew the ruling class and got their land reform, but they reinforced the worst misconceptions around Native Americans by fighting in costumes designed to generate fear. Those costumes included 
masks. And that fear was so strong, lawmakers made it illegal to wear masks in public as soon as the war ended. That's where we get New York Penal Law 24035, Subdivision 4, which prohibited two people wearing face masks or any face covering from congregating in public, and declared doing so would result in a criminal violation and up to 15 days in prison. Let's fast forward. On the 17th of April, 2020, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo mandated all New Yorkers wear face masks in public. He unquestionably had the authority to do this, not only because of his position as governor, but because just over a month earlier, he declared a disaster of emergency in the state of New York. This gave him leeway to pass additional executive orders to keep up with the rapidly changing state of the pandemic. Legally, and I'm not talking about public opinion, but legally, internal to government, the mask mandate shouldn't have been a problem. But for 37 days, it was, because there's still a 175-year-old law in effect in direct opposition to it. Enter SB 8415, the bill that, after 175 years, repealed the anti-mask law. The official justification for the bill makes it clear that it's had a history of being applied selectively. It started out to create accountability for one's actions in a crowd, but over the years, it morphed into a more general purpose anti-loitering law. That meant it could be used to stop offenses against public order. And a 1965 revision of the law said those offenses required no intent to create individual or public harm. They just had to be unsanitary or unwholesome from a social viewpoint. In other words, it was entirely subjective. Really, since the late 1960s, the anti-mask law was a convenient way for police to disband protests and blur the line that prevents state governments from interfering with the right to assemble. New York put an end to its anti-mask law on the 24th of May, 2020. That timing was coincidental, but it feels prophetic. People could argue for a lifetime if the anti-renters' ends justified their means. They could argue if the anti-rent law was constitutional. They could argue about pretty much anything that's happened in 2020. But that won't accomplish anything. Looking back at all of this history, even the present day, one thing is clear. Something unjust can only exist for so long before it reaches a boiling point and people will band together to fight against it. Ideally, the outcome is change. In the meantime, and going forward, it's important to remember, any legislation will have unintended consequences. Ambiguity or an archaic law still in effect that has the potential to oppress a group of people will only make things worse. It's near impossible for people in power to account for every way a law intended for good can be used for evil. The best we can do is try to hold our lawmakers accountable for making the laws they pass as absolutely 100% clear as they can, so those laws have the best chance of being equitable in practice. A very special thanks to everyone at the Cherry Hill Mansion in Albany and the Cradle State Historic Site in Wrestlinger, New York, for helping me with my research and allowing me to film. This video would not have been possible without them. There are links in the description to their website so you can find out more about everything they have to offer as well as information about visiting. That was one take! That was one take! I have no idea if there was sound, but it was one take. Ah. <laughs>